Okay, so building garden beds. Okay, so now here's what to do if you're just on straight lava. Okay, or if you're on good soil as well. Um, so again, it comes back to observation. Okay, we want to we want to figure out where our sun is, where our good soil is. Uh, find our garden site. Um, see our mulch crops nearby, or at least plan for them. Uh, and so, this is a quick way to get started. I didn't say it was super easy. It may be labor intensive at first, but the but if it's done correctly, it'll give you something that in the long run is going to be more efficient for you. It's kind of like doing it right the first time, right? You can do it right once, or you can do it wrong and then do it five times. So if we build these systems in, a, in the right way, you know, they'll perpetuate themselves, and in the long run, it, it's a very low maintenance system. Uh, so hugoculture beds. Uh, building garden beds. This is a great technique. It works well if you have soil. It works well if you have no soil. So basically what we're doing is we're taking logs, preferably rotten logs, but they can be fresh logs. These can be anywhere from here to here. Okay, Albizia does it pretty much any kind of log. Ironwood's probably not the best kind of log. <laughs> Um, so what we're doing, so we're laying out our garden beds. Okay, so we went through this process of figuring out, observing, seeing where our garden beds go. We have that figured out. If we've got a hillside, we want to go across that hillside instead of down that hillside. So a swale, and that's the difference between a swale and a diversion ditch. A on contour. Huh? On contour. On contour. So what? So what we're talking about here is we've got this slope, and the bed's going this way. Draw it. Thanks. I haven't used my marker yet. <laughs> my new markers. Okay. So if we've got our slope coming down here, the swale is basically this. Okay. So we're digging out this soil and we're building it up there. So when water runs down this hillside, it collects in there, right? And then that water percolates into this soil, if you have soil. Okay, but if you don't have soil, it's still, it's the same type of thing. In a bund, you can do this with rocks. You can lay rocks, you can lay branches, but the key is across the contour. So here, let's see another view of this. Okay, so we've got this hill. <coughs> okay, so we're talking about doing this. You'll see this in like the terraces in like the Far East. You ever see like the rice paddy terraces that hold water on the side of the mountain? That's basically exactly what we're talking about here. Okay, so we want to create our beds. If we've got a hill that we're working with, if we cannot work on a hill, it's probably preferable for most things. Um, but if we're working on a hill, maybe we want to create a bed that looks like that. Okay? And if this is a Google culture bed, so we're, then we're putting our logs here. We wouldn't even necessarily have to dig out this soil if we wanted to, but we could. So then we pile up our logs here. And then next comes sticks. Can you guys see this in the back? Should I be drawing this bigger? Something higher. Higher. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Now we got a real problem. So then they just change the landscape. This is in the Alps. <laughs> Oh, 
Uh, not ideal. Okay, so let's see. So now we're doing. All right, let's go back to flat ground for our cubic culture bed. Okay, so we're laying down logs. And now we're going to do a layer of sticks. They're smaller. Okay, and then we're going to do a layer of even smaller things. So like twigs. Um, and then finally we're going to do leaves on top of that. Okay, this is kind of similar to um, lasagna gardening. Layer gardening, people call this. It's virtually the same things. So, and then on top of this, you can add more, you can add soil. And it doesn't even necessarily have to go on the sides of your bed, just the top of your bed. <coughs> and then you can plant the little plants directly into that top layer. You inoculate it too as well. Yes, you can sure you can inoculate it with different things, microorganisms. So what's the point of this? Why stack all this stuff up? What are we trying to do? Store water. Store water. Soil. Store water. Build soil. Give a place for the roots to go. Give a place for the roots to go. Yeah, right? It's draining. Huh? Right, it's draining. It is drainage, and it's and it's moisture retention. Um, there's all these little air pockets in there for microorganisms. You know, it keeps it aerobic, so it's breaking down. It's not getting clunky. And that's just going to slow time release. You ever go in the woods and you find a dead log? You can squeeze the water out of it. Literally squeeze the water out of it like a sponge. So this is what we're creating here. We're creating a sponge, a moisture reserve, underneath this garden bed. So it's not only feeding our bed, but if there's a drought, a bed like this, you know, it's, it's already it's set up to weather that drought. Where if we just have a bed of soil, there's no moisture reserve down there. Um, coconuts you can use as well. I've seen this done with coconuts where you cut the coconut in the half, and then you have like a bowl you can have like, so you set them upright like this, you have all these little bowls, so when you water, they'll spill with water. <clears throat> you know, same type of technique here. Yeah. Would you use strawberry guava for that, or will you yes. just end up growing strawberry guava? Um, you can definitely use strawberry guava for this. Um, if you get it down, if you get it down in this bottom layer, you're probably okay. <laughs> <laughs> if not, if not, you may you may need to like put it somewhere to kill it first, and then use it. You know, so you may not want to use it really fresh. You may want to make sure it's dead before you put it into this mound. Yeah. Are, are there any plants that don't like the amount of methane that that much rotting foliage creates? Um, Repeat the question, please. Um, oh, he asked if there's any plants that don't like the amount of methane that that, that creates. I don't know. I don't think that's really uh, an issue with this technique. Anybody have problems with it? Does anybody use this a similar technique to this here? Any problems with anything like that? Have you notice any plants that don't like this? No. So as long as saying, it's aerobic, right? As long as there's oxygen exchange, there'll be less. Methane or simple carbon dioxide instead of decomposition. Right, so he's saying as long as they're keeping it aerobic, which that natural stacking, there's going to be air pockets in there, is doing, that, that, that the methane shouldn't be a problem. Are you planting immediately then? You can plant immediately, yes. And it's about this, that top layer. What kind of a top layer are you creating? You could just leave that pile put nothing on it, but it's going to take it at least like a year, maybe two, for it to break down enough so you can plant into it. Or, if you put like a foot of soil, you're fine. We just talked about six inches being all the plants really need, right? So if you put down some soil, some compost on top of that, you're good to go. And what I often like to do is, <coughs> this soil, if you have any existing soil in this path here, you don't need a fertile path. 
It's just going to grow you weeds in the path. So you dig this out, put it on top of your bed. You can also, if you've got really nice soil, you can also, before you build this, you can dig this to the side and then put it back on top. Yeah? Does, it, does the wood breaking down require more nitrogen? Uh, it can, but the other thing is, if you're putting a nice layer of soil on top of this, uh, you can definitely add green stuff to that layer. Absolutely. So you can, you can even add green stuff in between those layers. Are you going to talk? Yeah, I think it's a good point. Yeah. Are you going to talk about where you get soil? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, if you have any soil, you can use what you have. If you don't have any soil, you can either spend several years building soil, or you can have some soil brought in in a truck. <laughs> and, you know, if we talk about permaculture, um, you know, when is, it, when is it acceptable to use, you know, a bulldozer or a lawnmower or, you know, all these other kind of energy intensive tools? Well, if it's creating something that's going to be sustainable long term, it kind of justifies the use of it a little bit, <coughs> right? If we're creating a garden that's going to feed us for bringing in this truckload of soil, you know, if the truckload of soil costs us like what a month of our groceries bills cost, you know, it's, it kind of makes sense to me to bring it in if you need to. Yeah. You can look at mowing a lawn or look mowing like mob grazing, and you can just think about every time you cut it, the roots die back, it feeds the microorganisms, then you let it grow up, and it, you know, the roots grow out, and you just keep doing that, and that's, it just mimics mob grazing, it builds fertility. Nice. So she's saying that, um, that um, when we're talking about mowing, that if we're repeatedly mowing, it's kind of like, um, mob grazing where animals would come in and graze things down. And what I want to address though is, is that people without any soil, you know, this can be, if you're bringing in soil, I still recommend this. Bring in some woody material as well, you know, and you could build this right on straight lava. Yeah. Um. I was going to ask you about acidity. Do you ever add like oyster shell or lime into a pile like that? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, crushed coral, oyster shell, um, ag lime, it's all good. Um, you know, trace minerals are as good as well. Um, and I think it, uh, I think it talks about this here in the handout down um, there. And it will vary a little bit what your soil may need depending on where you are. <coughs> but lime, yeah. Uh, there's a great resource, if any of you don't know, you get free mulch at the Hilo Transfer Station. And free fire ants and free blood. <laughs> yeah, so he's saying that there's free mulch at the, at the Hilo Transfer Station. That is true. It may have some weed seeds in it. Um, I have never experienced fire ants coming in with that, personally. Have other people? No. They said they got it cleaned up. He has 20, he's gotten 20 loads of that mulch and doesn't have fire ants. I think it depends on your climate. I've got fire ants from it. I've got 20 loads there. And they do make a distinction between the pallets and the stuff that's green mulch. So you can ask them and they'll tell you what it is that they're, they're, they're putting in your truck. Cool. Uh, okay, so, so for your quick start guide, you know, you may decide that you need to bring in a truckload of soil. Um, there's a cinder soil um, mixed with uh, mac nut compost. It's really nice, really fertile. So it's got it's got cinder, it's got uh, like kamakua topsoil, and it's got mac nut compost all mixed together already for you. Um, you know, you can get the you can get the mulch from the transfer station. Who's, so, vend who's vending that soil? What's that? Who's vending the? Who's vending that soil? Um, most of the most of the yards around here oh. do that, like Sanford's. Um, what are the other ones? Bryson's. 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 Anyone else what around here? Those are me too. I I got a little bit of cinder soil. <laughs> <laughs> 
their analysis of the soil. It's basically a planting medium with no nutrient value. So it's a good thing to... If cinder soil comp not mixed with the compost though, right? Right. No, it's the cinder soil, not with right. the MacNut. Right, that's why the having the MacNut compost mixed in there is extremely beneficial. Yeah, but yeah. the MacNut doesn't, uh, you got to order from, uh, it has to no, come no, from... No, they make it mix. Where, here? Around Sanford, here? they make Sanford, it mix. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sanford, they have it yeah. here? Yeah. 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 So what, what's the difference between, like at Sanford they have um, topsoil and then they have this cinder soil with MacNut? What's the difference? So she's asking the difference between, um, so, so there's, there's straight, so they sell straight Hamakua topsoil, which is like clay-y, kind of gets like powdery, has no cinder in it at all. And then they sell um, a mix of that and cinder, and then they sell a mix of that and cinder and macadamia nut compost, okay? So the blend of those three together is really what you want if you're establishing new beds. Now if you're on straight cinder, maybe you want to get straight, straight hamakua soil and then mix it in. But it's a lot of work to mix it in. Yeah? Um, a really good resource for amendments is salt water for minerals. I'm sorry? Salt water for minerals. Salt water for minerals? A light. That yeah, I've heard that before. Anybody else use salt water here as mineral additive for your plants? Korean folk gardening folks recommended you dilute seawater. Diluted seawater. What's the dilution? Like 50 to 1. 50 to 1. Wow. Or 1 to 30. Or 1 to 30. I've heard those things have salt water on most of these trees. Yes, it does. Can you repeat? Um, so we're talking about amendments. So ways to amend these beds. Um, we're talking about um, um, uh, seawater, and that's a uh, 50, 30, to 1, according to the three of the So this is for like trace elements. Um, some plants are more sensitive to trace elements than others. Um, but, you know, it can't hurt to have them there. Azomite is another one that I use. It's a, it's a powdered uh, mineral supplement. It's got a lot of trace elements in it. It's easy to apply. It comes in a big bag. I don't have to go to the ocean. And, huh? Azomite. Azomite. It's, on, it's in the handout. Oh, it's in the handout. Yep. Urine? Um, you can use urine. That's nitrogen-based. Um, well, let's come back to um, so where were we? So, Google culture beds. Any other questions about <coughs> creating Google? These are all great questions, and finding local amendments is great. Uh, the crushed coral is um, is super cheap. It's fairly locally sourced. Is there anything else you recommend for for lime or altering pH? Where do, get, where do you get the crushed coral by the dump truck? Um, you can get that um, at uh, any any feed store or DEI or. Isn't crushed coral being harvested from the ocean? So she's saying it's being harvested from beaches, from what she understands, but there may be some controversy about that. Also, sheetrock from construction sites, you can powder that up and sprinkle it lightly. So sheetrock, gypsum? Yep. As long as it's not Chinese. As long as it's not Chinese. I have to buy a meal. That makes me a little nervous. Is mulch from the dump considered finely chopped? Yes. Okay. Yes, mulch from the dump is, is finely, very finely chopped. Uh, one thing we just learned recently from a soil guy up the Hamakua is the Hamakua soil, if you let it in the sun, it actually turns into little particles of cement and never re-wets. So he's saying if you put it on, make sure you've got it covered with something so that it always stays moist. And we've actually had that happen where you pour water on you can just see it sheet off. Uh -huh. So just to be aware. Um, so she's saying that the Hamakua, the straight Hamakua soil, 
it's um, yeah. hard. It can almost be like water, if it gets really dry, it can almost be like water repellent. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've used on my place uh, mulch and black cinder. Yep. I have a dirty black cinder and do it in layers. And you can build some amazing soil and get the mulch and layers of soil. He's saying that he's just used mulch, layers of mulch, and layers of black cinder. How about your layers? So, you know, mulch can be six to eight it shrinks down a couple inches of black. Just do it on alternate layers as you build your soil. Right. And it kind of mixes, it lightens the mulch. Right. So this is the same thing I was mentioning, kind of lasagna gardening, which is kind of very similar to what this is here. You know, you can mix some soil in here. He's saying that he just takes the dump mulch, lays a layer of that down, then layers a thin layer of black cinder, then layers another layer of dump mulch. You could also use, you know, you could also use weeds, get some weedy stuff in the bottom of that. Just, you don't want it where it's poking out. If you're getting the dump mulch, would you rather leave it, say you're getting dump truck loads, would you let it cook for a while before using it or? I prefer to. Like a yes. few months. Yeah. I prefer to let, so he's asking if the dump mulch, uh, to let it compost for a little while first. Let it heat up, let it start to decompose. And then I prefer to quarantine it for fire ants. <laughs> right? Do do a fire ant test while it's sitting out there, do it away from everything else, and then you know what you got. Uh, quick question about cinder. It seems like the black is great, but red black, no bueno. Yes, black cinder is good for growing things. Red cinder, not so good. Biochar? Biochar. I, I don't use biochar personally. Um, I think that it may be very, very good though. Definitely can't hurt anything. What's wrong with red cinder? Black and red cinder. Um, I believe the, the red has higher concentration of iron, is that correct? Yeah. Which is toxic. Which is toxic to the plant. The yeah. black breaks down more quickly. When you get it, it's already small. Right. The black is generally much much finer than the red. I've heard that putting mushroom mycelium in there helps it to break down really quickly. To mushroom mycelium to help break down the, the whole the logs and the logs. The whole yes, this whole thing. Sure, you can inoculate this. Um, you can you can even buy um, IMO indigenous microorganisms. You can buy a bag of um, I'm not sure what it is, but it's been inoculated with microorganism and you can just buy it at this so you know that KTA has bags of this stuff. Yeah, I think it's like wheat milling. Yeah, the leftover from, from processing wheat. What about worm composting? Does that really help break down the soil? I mean the cinders and well if you build it they will come. You build this pile and it's gonna be full of all kinds of critters. Millipedes Approaches, uh, worm earwigs, worms, they're all going to come and chow down on this. Microorganisms, fungi, you know, you're making a buffet for all these things. So, are cockroaches good for Sure. Yeah. yeah. You look at a pile of mulch that's been sitting there for like, you know, you were talking about letting our mulch age. You look at that top layer of mulch, it's like, 80% millipede droppings. <laughs> She's saying millipedes can be a problem. That's true, but they can also be a benefit. Yeah. Uh, can help it break down, cover it, or not? Um, there's really no need to cover it. Um, so it, the mulch covers it, right? So you have soil. So say this is our soil layer, and I didn't really draw here, but. Say we have another layer of, say this is the dump mulch, the fine mulch over top of that whole thing, you know, to sandwich it in. And then if we want to plant our seeds, then we just have, you know, a little spot there in the mulch where we can plant our seeds or small plants into it. And how long to break it down? How many months? To break down this whole stack? No, just the transfer station mulch. Just the transfer station mulch? 
Um, I don't know how long until that is completely gone. If you say you lay down a six inch layer of mulch, depends how much rain. Depends on how much rain you're getting. Depends on a lot of things. At least six months, I would say. It could be a year. Depends. I'm curious how much um, calcium or crushed coral oyster shell you would put down, just to, like sprinkle a little layer in there? <coughs> yeah, I'm not really scientific with my application of stuff like that. Like, say it was a bed like this size, I would probably use like cottage cheese or yogurt, you know, container full on an area this big. Of what? Of uh, crushed coral. But there's different, they have the application, if you're buying like ag lime, it tells you application rates right on the bag. Fire ash is a good amendment for that purpose. Too. Fire ash, he's saying, is a good amendment. Wood ashes and urine can be a complete fertilizer. But you've got to be careful with the wood ash because you can't over apply it. How about the urine? <laughs> um, same thing with that. You can, if you can use it. Um, some people dilute urine and use it as a as a fertilizer as well. <coughs> sure. Yeah. She's asking if we could throw in some cardboard. So if you had like a really if this was if you're doing this in a really weedy area, you can put down a layer of cardboard, which is the next thing on the topic: sheet mulching. You can lay down a layer of cardboard that would keep any weeds from popping up through there. Underneath the logs? Underneath the logs. I've also made something similar to this where, say this was a layer of logs and then a big layer of cane grass. And then a layer of cardboard over the cane grass and then the soil on top. And I didn't have any problems with cane grass coming up through it. I just wanted to say something about urine. Our soils are real phosphorus deficient, and that's one. And phosphorus is a disappearing resource. That's one of our best ways to get phosphorus. In okay, the great. So she's saying um, that phosphorus, our soils are generally deficient in phosphorus, and that um, phosphorus is a, um, a limited amount as far as a resource that we can tap into, and that urine is a really good source of that. Bananas love urine, yes. <laughs> always always pee on your banana trees. <laughs> Do you mean phosphorus or phosphates? <laughs> What's that? Phosphorus or phosphates? Phosphorus. Phosphorus. <laughs> okay, so I want to move this along to sheet mulching. Okay, so sheet mulching another technique. Yeah. So with sheet mulching, say we have some lawn here, or say we have area with big weeds. So <laughs> we just cut all this stuff down, and then we're going to add a layer of compost. This can be fresh compost, this can be old compost, um, whatever you've got around, kitchen waste, uh, animal manure. So you're basically putting a layer of that down. You can also put down a bunch of like gnarly weeds like honahona, like I said before, cane grass. Um, there are some things I would leave out. Um, What's the name of the grass? I think it's called Kikiu grass. It has these big nodules. Why not Kikiu grass? <laughs> yeah, anything that like will come up through a really massive layer of stuff and with the like nodules, <laughs> I would leave, leave that stuff out. <laughs> but it, basically anything else you can put in here. I would also probably leave out anything that's super allelopathic, like ironwood I probably wouldn't use. Christmas berry? Um, I would use some in the bottom there, but... Even decomposed ironwood? This decomposed is okay. But mainly you want to put a lot of green stuff, high nitrogen stuff in here. Um, and then you lay your cardboard over top of that. And so that cardboard 
It's just acting as a weed barrier to keep anything from growing up through there. If you don't have that, you can have grass, you know, that just goes right up through and starts growing out. Okay, so that cardboard is crucial to, to turn this around. So if this where is, can we get cardboard, Wade? Where can you get cardboard? <laughs> <laughs> I know the, um, the hardware's ace. recycling down in Hilo has as much cardboard as you can drive away with. Where? where? Atlas Recycling in Hilo. Um, Steve gets it from there. It's like, well, like 20 six bucks. Six cents a pound. Six cents a pound. Um, but I mean, there's lots of places that are just, you know, it's free, you know? It's free. Ace. Yeah, there's different stores Everywhere. that just have yeah. piles of cardboard behind them. Okay, so same thing here. So if this is a thinner layer, Say, okay, so we laid our cardboard, we laid some stuff down here, and we lay our cardboard down. If this is a thin enough layer, we might be able to just dig down here and plant directly into it. If it's a thicker layer, we may want to dig out a little spot and put some soil in here. So we can create a pocket of soil in the sheet mulch if we want to plant a seed or a young plant. Okay, and then by the time this plant's roots reaches down here, the stuff, this other stuff will start to decompose already. Mm. So you can plant directly into a sheet mulch bed as well. And again, we can all, you can also make kind of a combination of these two. Uh, let's see, up sheet mulching. Huh? Um, so with the sheet mulching, you can also lay down some of your, some of your different amendments as you make that bed. Can we use banana leaves instead of cardboard, Wade? Uh, you can. You can use banana leaves instead of cardboard, um, but you need to use a lot of them, multi-layers, and make sure they're overlapping, like several of them. And when you're doing your cardboard as well, you need to make sure it overlaps at least six inches everywhere. You don't want any little holes. Mm -hmm. This stuff can come up through them. What's it called? Palm fronds? A uh, palm fronds. Palm fronds are good. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do about the snails and slugs? Mm -hmm. uh, snails and slugs that like to get under the cardboard. <laughs> um, you know, the slug and snail control. That's a whole, whole other ball game. Um, salt kills them. What's that? Salt kills snails. Salt kills snails. Um, it does, but it can also kill your plants. Yeah. You train Muscovies when they're three days old to follow you? Yeah. You just unfold them every week. You unfold? You unfold the cardboards and stuff or just go around? Okay. I don't have to plug around. Oh, wow. She's saying she has Muscovy ducks. And she trains them to follow her around, which is their instinct. And then she pulls back the cardboard, and then the ducks eat all the slugs and snails. Do they even go after the African ones? No. No? <laughs> you don't have those? Speak up, speak up. What about that, um, that organic slug stuff that you can buy? Your organic slug stuff? Um, yeah, that turns into like an iron... Something Sluggo. Like Sluggo. Yeah, Sluggo. Um, I have used that before. Any other results with Sluggo? Anybody find Sluggo effective? I think it's great. In, in high rain, it disappears fast. In high rain, it disappears fast. Yeah. Uh, another solution for snails is human hair. They can't cross it because it's protein. And it's a trick I learned in the Midwest. So you can go to a, a salon, a hair cutting place, and put hair around your plants, and the snails won't cross it. You know, I've, I've lined a lot of beds with little copper tapes and stuff. I have not, I have not had any kind of good success with, with copper. Um, has anybody had a good success with cop with using copper to deter, deter slugs? Yeah. 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 If I put a strip that's three inches wide around a raised bed and they can't get around it or through it. Okay, that's a really good strategy, and I, I I've seen some people who use a, a trap, so they'll have their whole garden pretty clean with like a fine mulch, and then they'll take like the base of like a coconut frond or a board, 
and they'll sit those out, spaced around their garden, and then they'll come and they'll flip the, and then even if they can use those in the daytime, they flip that over in the day because that's where the slugs and the snails go to hide, right? They like to crawl under things to hide. So you flip those over, squish them all, Bring your put your ducks. slugs in the ducks. Give it to your ducks. Yes. You're giving to your ducks. Thank you. <laughs> He's saying they're attracted to light and it'll collect them at night. They're attracted to light and they'll collect them. Beer. Yeah, so beer traps. So beer traps is basic. So how do you make your beer traps? Uh, I take a pot so the shower doesn't get diluted with water and make enough space to like, crawl in in the shade and then you start with the fermenting smell. From you take a pot? Yeah, upside down. Like a, so that it doesn't get diluted with all the amount of rainfall that we have. Okay, so something to protect it from rainfall. Sticks under it and then they can come up underneath and then drown in it. Okay, so basically something to protect from rainfall and then some kind of a container to hold beer. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you just go in there. And they have a really good time. Yeah, yeah. And then they die. <laughs> <laughs> and then they die. Yeah. They drink all sorts of stuff. They get an OD. Yes. Overdose. What a way to what a way to send right, them out, huh? Cheese, your chicken, your ducks, your eggs. I'm sorry. Was that a question? The slugs transfer any disease to your chickens, ducks, and eggs. Okay. So he's asking if the slugs can transfer any diseases to the chickens and then to the eggs that we could consume. I don't believe so. I uh, anybody?